Hi there, welcome to the program everyone. Really privileged today to be joined by Mr. Andy Paul, who would have to be one of the most respected and influential sales thought leaders in the world. Uh, on LinkedIn, he's got a huge following, more than 168,000 followers. His Accelerate podcast has more than 600 episodes, you've got to check that out. And uh, he's the author of uh, a couple of books at least, and one of those books was ranked in the top 20 sales books of all time by HubSpot. So uh, without any further ado or introduction, welcome Andy Paul to the show. No, Steve, thanks for having me. Quite All a nice right. introduction. <laughs> well, I think you, you, you've earned it. You've earned no, actually, it. I'm, and, and, uh, and we're, up, we're up to 701 episodes now on the podcast. Wow, that's awesome. Over <laughs> 700. Like, how, how long how, how long's that podcast been going? Uh, three and a half years. Wow, three and a half years, 700 episodes. That's like 200 a year. Yeah, we Every couple of for days. a while there, we were cranking out several episodes a week. Yeah. Wow. Well, pretty impressive. Well, a thank great you. Great library there. Really great library. I've listened to quite a few. All right, Andy, let's, let's get into it. I, I wanted to cover a few subjects here. First off, I'd like to get your thoughts on what is the role of the sales function in the modern corporation? And <laughs> what is it? What should it be? You know, when we think about the transient nature of competitive advantage and so forth, mm -hmm. um, you know, what are your thoughts on this? And you're talking about the actual salespeople themselves, right? I mean, it's, it's, yeah, you know, at, at the highest level, you know, the function of sales, uh, somebody summed it up once recently, which I thought was great. It's get them, keep them. <laughs> and if you want to <laughs> sum, summarize sales, that's a good, good description, right? Yep, get sure. them, keep them. Um, and increasingly, you know, the, in the modern sales structure, it's really focused on the get them part, right? Because oftentimes mm. now companies have customer success teams or account management teams that hand, you know, get the handoff of the account from the, the sales organization once they've been closed and they responsibly for upselling and retention. Um, so it seems increasingly we're seeing sales really focused on new business, new account capture. And, sure. and that, yeah, probably in a nutshell is, is what you see more of the focus on. You and I have had previous conversations about you know, how we appropriately allocate resources within that function. But, you know, I think you know, I was just at the Unleash conference, which is a sort of user conference for outreach, the sales engagement platform, and here in San Diego. And, and you know, whole industries are being built around the idea of, you know, proactive outbound outreach and, uh, you know, bringing in more prospects at the top of the funnel. Yeah. But do you think that the sales function's got more of a responsibility to help a company stand out in the market or differentiate themselves, just given that that products have become yes. you know, any any product advantage that that we had or used to have, or the old sustainable competitive advantage, just doesn't really exist as it used no. to exist, right? So, so the sales function that doesn't need to step up and, and and be that that differentiator. It does, and I think that so. Yeah, I think, and I've sort of prefaced my first book with this comment that, you know, how you sell is more important than what you sell. And, and I like still believe that too. Yeah. Yeah. And I still believe that's, that's the case because really it's the how is really, if you want to sort of put a different spin on, that's really the buyer's experience with you in the midst of their buying process. Right. And yeah, the data Gartner, other people talking about, I mean, it seems like increasingly that is a differentiator because yeah, if the products are relatively the same, what are sort of the tiebreakers that, buyers use to make a decision. And yes. oftentimes those are going to be the intangibles, you know, because okay. the prices are all sort of the same within a certain bounds, the features and functionality are all the same with those certain bounds. The customers can achieve relatively same outcomes. Uh, then yeah. How are they making their choice? Well, it's, it's going to be these intangibles. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, so, so let's get into that theme because I thought it's a very profound statement that sort of runs through a lot of your, you know, I read this, the, the most recent book is you know, how you sell, not what you sell. And uh, mm -hmm. we could probably talk about this all day. Um, but, but explain to us what, what you mean by that. Well, it gets back to this idea of the buyer experience really is, is that, you know, it, you could 
choose a number of different products. Let's say your your company is looking for a new law firm. Let's just start, you know, use that as one example. Yeah. Is you could go out and talk to 15 law firms and you could bring them all into a conference room and line them up side by side. And for all intents and purposes, you could close your eyes and pick one and you'd probably get the service that you want. But so how do you make that decision? Well, increasingly we're seeing that happen in technology fields, right? The barrier to entry to markets is low. You know, technology is easily portable, easily copied. So any sort of sustained product advantage or differentiation you might have disappears pretty quickly. And yeah. so in that instance, then, on what basis is the buyer making their choice? Mm. And yeah. there could be some built-in preferences for certain companies based on geographies or whatever. But, you know, in general, I believe, and my experience has shown, and I think the research is beginning to show, is that it's, it's you know, the buyer's experience not, how they're using the product, but the buyer's experience during that process of making their decision. Are you able to come in and help them navigate that reasonably quickly and enable them to, and enable them to be able to make a decision with the least investment of time and money possible? And that's really mm -hmm. what, what companies want to do. I, uh, I talk about this in the book, Jeffrey Colvin uh, wrote best-selling author in one of his books included a statement that, you know, companies now view the ability to, gather information quickly to make good decisions without tremendous investment, they view that as a competitive advantage because, you know, when they're making the decision to change or to invest in something, well, they're doing it with a reason, right? They've got a business case. This is going to help us grow the top line. It's going to help us defer the bottom or, yes. or excuse me, increase the bottom line, reduce costs, whatever the, that outcome is they want to achieve. Well, why do you want to spend a year to make a decision on something that you could make the decision on in six months if somebody would help you do that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, and, and you talk a lot about that, the, the responsiveness and, and, and helping the buyers, you know, move their, move their process along as well, okay. right? So, so we have a responsibility or we should be somewhat expert at that, at helping them do that. And, um, right. Well, I think that one of the, the key things that's, again, through Gartner Research and others are, are pointing out is, and I think those of us who have sold into the enterprise, who have sold complex systems into the enterprise, have known this for a while, but I, but it is true. And we're selling, you know, a wider range of, of companies are buying these more complex software products now and so on is that it's not something that the company does very often. So they don't really have a binder on the shelf that says, mm. you know, here's our, here's our buying process for buying a yep. CRM system. <laughs> I mean, they, they don't have that. And, you know, they may have some guidelines for how they work with procurement, but, and Gartner, I think published this great, graphic this last uh, fall of, of based on the research of what buyers view of what the buying process looked like. And even they call it, you know, the big bowl of spaghetti. <laughs> you know, it's, right. it's, not a, it's not a linear staged based process as sales likes to imagine. Yeah. Our process funnel, is. We put the customer in the top or, and or we a, try and drive them funnel. through. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, there's the funnel and then there's, you know, the stage driven process. Yeah. And, you know, the exit criteria for every stage. I mean, it's, it's useful to think about things somewhat in that, that way, but you can't be so wedded to it that you're blinded to. It bears no resemblance at all to how the customer makes their decision. Yes. So I think increasingly we're going to find that part of the role of a seller in a business to business, again, more on the complex side, is to be able to help the buyer understand how they make decisions in okay. this in this for buying this type of product. And so it's a collaborative thing. You're going to get in. And there's been some authors that have been writing about this for like Sharon Drew Morgan. have been writing about this for quite some time. Yep. Is that that is the role of sell. You have to teach your buyers how to buy. Mm. And increasingly the research seems to be to bear that out. And again, for those of us that had experience doing that, we might not put a name to it, but, but yeah, that's what we've been doing. Yeah, well, yeah, we've been good sellers have been doing this for a long time, haven't they? Well, yeah, and I think it helps to put a name to it. So yeah, because it's sure. the the need to do it is is increasing, not decreasing. So yeah. as I said, is you know, look at SaaS products. Some of these are pretty complex. They're sold on a uh, you know subscription basis, so it, it makes the cost and the investment you know profile a little bit different than if they're buying as a hosted piece of software. But it's still a it's a significant commitment. It's a both from a price and a commit, you know, resource commitment to implement. Yeah, you got You got to help people yeah. understand how that's how that's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, so let's talk about getting them and 
keeping them or more on the getting them, I guess. <laughs> and, and, and I like to stay with this theme on, on the, on the how as well, because, mm-hmm. um, you know, maybe the, the old sales culture that you talk about focused a lot on activity and you had to sort of hit activity numbers. Um, but you could do activities in a, in a number of different ways, right? There, there's a good way of doing activities is a bad way. And, uh, that the how comes in there as mm-hmm. well. Um, so could you, could you explain, you know, what, what's important in, in, uh, in the how in, in getting customers here? Yeah, I, I really like to simplify things and to put yeah. away people, you know, understand very clearly. And, and so when you look at it from the perspective of the buyer is, you know, their metric, uh, again, Gartner bears this out is, is their metric is not a stage, it's progress. Mm. are they making progress and because they're not stage based they're more the buying process is more job based and there's a lot of sort of <laughs> uh looping the that's called where people come back and revisit jobs that they thought were previously closed and so on um is that you have to you know you have to be sort of focused or no well, sort of you have to be laser focused in your sales interactions to say okay what are we going to accomplish in this call? What is the value I'm going to deliver? Mm-hmm. Whether it's a question, an insight, uh, you know, analysis, a calculation, whatever, that is going to help the buyer make progress. Mm. Okay. And if if I don't know the answer to that question, then why am I consuming some of their time? Right? Why would I reach out? Why would I have a sales call? Why would I send an email? Why would I do anything with the buyer if it demands that they? use some of their time to consume it and there's no value there for them. Mm. It's not, it's not going to help them make progress. Yes. And and it's this this type of simplicity that, you know, is missing from playbooks. It's missing from that you see these days, especially with some of the systems, you know, the automation systems that we, we put in place is that, you know, we're defining touches that add no value. And so we really have to take a step back and say, okay, let's look again from the buyer's experience. You know, if the mm. buyer, if the buyer gives us some of their time, which is a valuable asset to them, they give us some of their time. If we don't give them a return on the investment of that time, then they'll stop giving us time. Yeah. And, and this, this calculation is something to me is, is really um, just fundamental to sales, right? It's the, it's the bargain at the heart of every yes. sales interaction. Buyer gives you something, i.e. either time. What are you giving them in return? Mm. And too often, sellers go out and, hey, I'm going to do a check-in call or, you know, I really need to reach out and, and touch bases with this customer. It's like, why? What are they getting from this? Yes. <laughs> they, and so we have to think about the actions we take from the perspective of the buyer. Sure. If I do this, you know, how's the buyer going to perceive it? What do they get from it? And if they do get something from it that helps them make progress, what are they going to do next? Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's really important. So, so every interaction we have with the customer should have some goal to move the, the process forward. We should be bringing mm-hmm. value to the customer with each interaction. So um, it, that takes some planning and preparation. It takes yeah. some thinking time, right? It does. I mean, sales, sales is not a rote robotic process. Sales is mm. a deliberate creative process and that's, and people have to change their mindset. You know, you don't get into sales just to execute a script or to execute a, a, a you know, a process. Cause this is the way somebody read it in a book and this is the way you should do it. Yep. It's like, no, I, what, what needs to happen in this next interaction for to help the customer achieve what they want to achieve to help them get closer to making that decision. And that requires, yeah, thought and planning. It doesn't require an hour of planning. I mean, if you're engaged in an account, and I spoke at this at a spoke about this at an event this morning here in San Diego, is if you're doing a pipeline review, if you're a manager, yep. is you're only, you really only have to ask two questions about every opportunity. What's the value that we need to deliver on the next interaction, whatever that is, to help the customer make progress toward making a decision? And as a result of delivering that value, what steps are they going to take next? And if mm. the rep is so disengaged from the, the account that they don't know the answer to that question, then that's a big red flag. You know, yes. it could be, 
it's just not a qualified prospect at this point in time, or we need to go back. We really need to do qualification, find out what outcomes they want to, you know, discovery and qualification, discover what outcomes they really want to achieve, qualify yeah. whether we can help them do that. But if, you know, it's, we're too superficial. Yeah. Or they could be spread too thin, right? They're going after too many by necessity, right? Opportunities and yes. they're probably getting a low hit rate. And so that low hit rate becomes sort of, they think that's a metric that's uh, etched in stone. So I've got to keep getting more opportunities instead of. Right. Well, and there's yeah. certain companies that do that. Yeah. They say, look, if I can yield five orders out of 200, 200 leads at the top of the funnel, then if I want double sales, I just get 400 leads. <laughs> and, yeah. And, and I've had this conversation with CROs of SaaS companies in particular, which is nicely implying that that's kind of crazy behavior is one instead of closing five opportunities out of 200 leads, close 10. Yeah. And part of the solution to that is just, as you said, is, is, you know, we have companies that, that put these metrics incentives on top of sales managers for pipeline coverage ratios. You know, you need to have yes. five times, you know, the MRR, MRR in your pipeline of the, of your target for the month. That just encourages bad behavior. Yeah, Absolutely. Poor qualification, poor discovery, just because you don't want that prospect to go away because you're being judged by the size of your pipeline. Yes. Hey, Andy, do you think there's some danger of, of some groupthink happening in the sales profession, say, like specifically the SaaS companies, but others as well, um, you know, where they're picking up on some of this data on close rates and lead to close ratio and, and, and so forth from different surveys that you know, different uh, consultancies do and, and publish and it becomes, it sort of gets its own momentum, but it might not actually stand up to much scrutiny. Like what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think they don't give it enough scrutiny. So, I mean, there's general acknowledgement from multiple yeah. sources. And again, we, I'm not sure the research is great within the sales industry. So we, but we look at it as data points and, and yeah, my multiple company CSO insights and others report that, geez, you know, smaller percentage of sales reps are making quota every year. The close rates in the B2B space are dropping as Forrester has documented some of their research. So sort of collectively as data points, that's saying, well, okay, everybody's rushing to jump on a specific sales model, but it doesn't really seem to be working. I mean, yeah, there are sure, people point to the unicorns. They'll say, okay, well, this company is mm. growing really fast. And they say, that's because of the sales model. Well, no, it's not because of sales models, because they've got the right product at the right time that people need. And the fact is, yep. you know, that the failure rate. It would have been successful with any model, maybe. Well, yeah. And I think that yeah. I think you can make the argument, given, you know, this external data we but see. Let's is, not follow Apple sales model, right? <laughs> yeah. Apple success is not because of the sales. Let, let, let's be no. fair. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and yeah, for all those companies, there's a lot of factors that contribute to their success, including just flat out luck that for certain points of time, you yeah. know, fortune conspired to help them, not all the time, but sometime. So, but yeah, the, the, there's certainly people have fallen in love and, you know, somewhat rightfully so with this sort of one version of the inside sales model, it's brought SAS to a certain distance, but I yeah, it's, it's creaking, you know, it's springing leaks. It's, it's, you know, we need to revise it. We need to relook at it and challenge some of the assumptions because, you know, there is no data that can show you that says, well, geez, if maybe instead of all this inside sales model, what if we just had field reps out still developing prospects <laughs> that they wouldn't be selling as much? We don't know. I mean, right. it, there's no data that proves that this is generating more revenue per rep or more revenue per hour of selling time than yes. any other model. It works. It'd be interesting because anecdotally, yeah. I do know companies that are still very field heavy, having great success. Uh, I, I know other companies who have field team in one segment, a mixed field and inside in another field team doing quite well as well. It's anecdotal though. So yeah. As and, it is across it, the board. Yeah, it is. It is. So it, it would, yeah, we, we shouldn't just assume things. And also a lot of these surveys are, are measuring averages, right? They're, yeah. they're looking at lots of companies across different industries with different length of sales cycle, different value of products. And so to say, you know, that close ratio is declining or improving or is I'm going to apply that in my business. It, it's 
almost impossible to to draw a conclusion from that from something so broad as well it is and i think your point about groupthink is exactly right i mean there's certain dynamics within silicon valley in terms of you know how things become popular like certain sales models and so on yep and and then it's a becomes you know broadly applied right this is the recipe everybody follow the recipe and yeah i'm beginning to see now and work with teams where the management is saying okay well there's parts of it that work, but we're really re-looking at this because the way we first started out, so are following the recipe, not getting us the results we like. You know, maybe our product is more complex than normal and, and having yep. SDRs who are least experienced people, having them as the front line of attack, even if they're just setting up a meeting, yeah, it's not helping us, right? Because we need to demonstrate more value more quickly in our sales process. Right, right. So, so Andy, a lot of these surveys are showing salespeople are performing worse. Mm. All right. Do you think salespeople are worse today than, than they used to be? <laughs> no, I don't think they're worse. Yeah, I, I wrote about this uh, in my daily yep. newsletter a couple of days ago. Is, is Yeah, the, these people, I think, are infected by nostalgia, thinking about how hard it was in the old days, and sellers today are soft. And, and I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, it's mm. I, again, I was just at the outreach conference. Lots of young you know, people in the first decade of their career and there was as much energy and excitement and enthusiasm for, for sales as any generation has. So I, I think that's, that's not the issue. I think that, you know, part of it is the model, but also I think part of it is, is you know, there's no logic behind how quotas are set. And right. so what I see is, is what, and I asked the question in the presentation I gave this morning, I said, so, you know, let me ask this question is, okay, you, let's say you raise quotas 10% a year. Do you have a measure for how, what percentage of growth you've seen in the capabilities of your team? Mm. So if there's a gap between that, so if your team hasn't upskilled its capabilities by 10%, you're raising quotas 10%, you've just developed a gap. Yes. And companies are sort of unmindful about this because they're not making the requisite investments in training and education on an ongoing, continuous basis, daily basis mm -hmm. that need to have happen. But there aren't very few companies with real learning cultures out there that, that say, look, we're going to make you oh, smarter great. every day. And so I believe part of the problem is we've got this growing gap between expectations for the reps and what the companies are investing to make them skilled, to put them in a position to grow. And that's what's reflected in these numbers is, is no, I agree. No, I, on quotas, I, I, I'd love to see the numbers on uh, how overlaid quotas are today compared to 10 years ago or, or before, because I see a huge amount of overlaying, especially these SaaS companies coming out of the Valley and, and just like throwing lots of bodies uh, into mm -hmm. a territory. Maybe that territory has got a, a $10 million quota, but they allocate out, 20 million to the, mm -hmm. the only two or three of the sale out of 10 sales reps make their target. Which, yeah, I, I'm, undoubtedly that is occurring. And that's, that's not just a SaaS issue. That's a, oftentimes a startup phenomenon, right? Where you're trying yep. to scale more quickly. And, and I see it outside tech as well, but, and I think the danger there is a little bit bigger. And so what, what we've done is we've created this real class system in sales, right? We've got the A players, we've got the B players, we've got the C yep. players, and then the people we're going to fire. And there's not enough thought being given to saying, look, it's not that I have A players, B players, and C players. I've got players perhaps with different capabilities, different specialties, different skills. Some may perform at a certain level. Some may perform at another level. And I'll take this this lower level performance if it's consistent and predictable right why why wouldn't okay. i and sure. so so why not maybe they don't get paid quite as much you know they're a different compensation so what you know yeah but, but, then but their net but then, roi is more more than acceptable to yeah the, and then and then yeah. celebrate the fact that these people are doing that so i can why not have you know the three presidents clubs you know for a the superstars, great. You yep. guys work on these big strategic accounts. The other you guys work, you know, here, your quota's not quite as high. Our expectations perhaps not quite as high, but they're mm. professional, they're competent, they're good at what they do. Sure. And we celebrate their success. And instead, sort of the prevailing ethos mm. and culture in sales is if you're not the quote unquote superstar, we're looking down our noses at you. Yeah. And you're basically on a, 
on a short a short string, right? Yeah, which is just insane because it we've is, got by definition, yes, yeah, 70, 80, 90 percent of people are failing and feeling bad about themselves. <laughs> exactly. So why are we doing that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's when, true. When, this is one of my hot buttons is when did we make being good a negative? Yes. Right. We're so okay. obsessed with this idea of excellence. You know, if you're not excellent, it's like, nah, that's BS. I have, if I had people that are predictably good mm. and I've had that in situations, oh, I had grown yeah, teams. Year in, year are, out. Year in, year out. Yep. We're going to grow that company faster than if you keep trying to hit home runs with superstars that, you know, they don't perform at a higher probability rate than anybody else you bring into the company. Absolutely. All right, and just what change gears a little bit. Talk about sure. the the sales process, like end to end, and we know there's uh, a lot of focus on prospecting and getting new accounts, or mm -hmm. you know, that that you know that outbound component. Um, so, so what sort of focus should that have versus like the discovery side side of the process? What what's your view on that? Well, this is like the third rail of sales. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you, know, you don't really want to touch it. Yeah, I think we become obsessed with this idea of, you know, top of the funnel. I mean, it's, you need to have prospects. Of course, you need to have prospects. There's no argument. Yeah. But we've created whole industries around this idea of lead gen and, you know, new business development and so on. And yet, that's fine. You got to have prospects. But it's what happened next that's way more important to, to getting an order. Yes. Right? Okay. You have to, you have to do discovery. You got to do your needs analysis, your qualification, disqualification, equally as important, if not more important than qualification. Uh, you know, there's so much that goes on there. I think you call it middle of the funnel activities, but yep. that to me, that's the core sales. Now, you notice in, in my books, both of my books, I don't really talk about prospecting much because, you know, I, I assume that you do what you have to do to get leads. Sure. But it's really, but you can have as many leads as you want. If you can't execute on those leads, you're going to get these low close rates that we see in sales today. And so I want to focus and say how in my career, yeah, I didn't run five X my pipeline. I, and when I work with teams, we try to bring that down as, as high, as low as we can because we want to close as high a fraction of deals as possible. Mm. So we need to empower and enable our sellers with the skills to be able to do that. And instead, we're just saying, look, let's just get as many leads as we can at the top of the funnel and then we'll accept a relatively low close rate because it's predictable. Yes. As, as opposed to saying, well, fine, if I'm, getting, if I'm spending money to generate 100 opportunities, let's invest even more to do a better job once they're into our sales process. And yeah, so, I, yeah, I agree. And I, I don't understand it. Um, I talk to a lot of sales teams or sales leaders just so enamored with that front end of the pipeline and, and loading more in and just assuming their experienced sales account managers can, you know, can, can manage the sale from there, but, but not really having a, a, a solid process or a, a structured process or, or, or a, even a, a philosophy on how they do that. Yeah. Well, I think that the part of the reason for that is that, you know, we now have these tools that, that give us a tremendous amount of visibility into what's happening at the, the front end of the funnel in a yes. way that we never did before. So, you know, there's certain, there's a degree of cert certainty about that, that somebody, yep. somebody gravitates to, right? Because there's so much that's uncertain about sales. It's just sort of human nature. I'm going to gravitate to those things where I can have data that I can point at and say, great, you know, here's a fair amount of certainty about what we're doing. Whereas once you start getting into the rest of the sales process, it's, yeah, it's not quite as certain. There's, there's more sure. uncertainty. There's more human variability because now you're really getting to the human to human interactions. Yes. And that's, that's harder. So, um, yeah, I understand to some degree, but I think it's, it's something that really needs to be reevaluated in terms of people really understanding what makes the deal close. Mm. You know, the fact that somebody's a prospect doesn't make them close. That's what happens after that. Yeah, for sure. So, so what are the key components? Like we could again talk all day on this. What are the key components of a strong discovery uh, type of process here? Well, I think we've seen you know discovery sort of um, you know given it, like everything you know people want to be more scripted and mm. we need to get this issue about are we educating our sellers enough about business and about their customers. Yep. So we'll say business acumen and customer acumen. Are we giving them enough of those two things 
to enable them to really understand how business operates and to do effective discovery. And I think one of the things, you know, we're sort of struck on these, or stuck on these tropes of the past about discovery. So, you know, one of my bugaboos that I counsel people and coach people not to do is don't ask about pain points. Mm. You know, I think, I think when companies are investing for the most part, and my experience has been this, is that they're investing to achieve a certain outcome. You know, it's a goal, it's an objective, yeah. you know, they, they're, they're here and they want to go there. Okay. And so how, how did, how do they, how do they span that gap? What stand, what are the challenges standing in their way of getting from mm. here to there? And those yes. challenges are your solution, right? That's, mm. that's, that's where you're, that's your ball field to play on right there. Yep. So if we're looking at pain points, for me, we're really, that's retroactive, right? Or retrospective, you know, we're looking in the past to say, yes. okay, what's been the problem as opposed to companies are generally forward looking. Mm. And so to me, that's the fundamental. Yeah. Like yeah, it, what's the new market you're trying to get into? Uh, is there a profitability problem you're trying to fix? Are you trying to reduce expenses somewhere or are you trying to improve service levels to a certain community? What's, yeah. What's the outcome you want to achieve? Yes. And so that outcome is something that you think if they're making an investment, it's going to give them a positive return on that yep. investment. But along the way, you are going to uncover the status quo and the pain points and then yeah, like start building that gap, right? So mm -hmm. maybe not specifically asking customers about pain points. It's quite a negative. It's quite a hard thing to do. But that's, um, but that's how people are yeah. being trained. We've got people they are. today. They are. I think it's almost impossible. Trained. I think it's almost impossible to, uh, to be leading with that. Yeah. What, what keeps yeah. you up at night? Well, nothing keeps me, so, no, a cup, keeps me up at night. A cup of coffee keeps me up at night. I mean, it's those types of questions that you still sure. see even, you know, relatively complex B2B sales. It's just like, yeah, we got to get past that. You know, we have to be business people. And so we're approaching another business person. You're getting ready to make an investment. Sure. Your buyer, you make an investment. So what's the fundamental thing people expect from an investment? They expect a return on that investment. Yes. So that's going to be represented by what outcomes increased market share, you know, top line growth, bottom line growth, you know, it could be time to market. It could be whatever that, that factor is. That's what you're discovering. You're discovering yes. what that outcome is. And people tend to think about discovery too frequently as, well, I have 20 questions I need to have, I need to ask. And those 20 questions represent, represent discovery. No, they don't. Discovery no. is what's the outcome. Why are they spending their time talking to you? What do they really want to achieve? And it, sometimes takes digging it sometimes takes you know challenging them as like the challenger sale is yep. challenging what they perceive as the outcome they want to achieve maybe there's a better way to achieve it that's fine but a lot of that happens in the discovery phase yeah absolutely agree no i'm a big fan of focusing on discovery and uh yeah do think it's it, it is un, un misunderstood and you know under invested in for sure so, so Andy, what, what else is, is, is on your mind or what are you thinking about at the moment that you might like to share uh, with the audience here? <laughs> How much time do we have? Um, <laughs> well, we've covered, we've covered a lot of them, but I, for me, it's, is, you know, as we see more, more automation coming into sales and you know, some fantastic tools out there, tools I use, tools, you know, my clients and other customers use is we need to remember that still at heart sales is a human to human business, right? And if you want to make an investment in yourself as a seller to reach your goals is your foundation of success has to be the human sales skills. I mean, you can be as oriented towards your process and the data as you want, but at the end of the day, the customer's still buying from you, you as an individual. Yes. And if you've, and so are you able to, build those relationships with, have the demonstrate, you know, build the rapport, connect, engage people's interests, you know, be interesting to them, build trust. And I, I like to, you know, people look at this in the model of a leadership is can you inspire the buyer mm. to want to follow you down the path that you've laid out? And, you know, we talk about just discovery, right? You're identifying these gaps and the objectives. Yeah. You're, you're helping collaboratively. You're defining what that path is you're basically leading them, right? Yeah, for sure. And are they inspired by the vision that you've, by you, the, are they inspired by the vision you've painted for them and are they willing to follow you? And yeah. so that's these, the, what I consider the craft of selling, right? Mm. So there's the science of selling, 
there's the data of selling, the science of selling being the social psychology, the brain science, understanding how people make decisions, how you can influence. There's the data part, which is all of our math of sales, right? The conversion rates. Mm. But then there's this essential element of the craft and you have to, that's the human aspect of it. And you have to master that perhaps more importantly than all the others. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think really well said. I, I think so critical, like as we said at the start, you know, we can't be falling back on our product advantage or our company's advantages uh, to be successful. We really yep. have to be very professional salespeople. Um, you know, and we've always had to be, uh, but I think it's even more important uh, in, in today's situation. And I would encourage people to, to yeah. sort of rethink their self image about what it is they're doing and, and say, okay, well, if, if job one, if what's the first thing that has to happen before somebody will buy something for you from you is you do have to form this connection, this relationship. And it's, you know, we don't like go down the rabbit hole about a relationship, but you know, it's a productive working relationship with this other yep. person, a trust-based relationship. Yeah. You have to be able to develop that. That's, that's, if that doesn't ever occur, you're never going to get the order from somebody. So in essence, you can almost rethink your job as a professional seller. Say, look, I am, yes, I'm a professional salesperson. I'm actually, I'm a relationship professional. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And if you don't master those fundamental skills, again, you have a big chunk missing in your portfolio of skills. You're just not going to succeed and, the way Andy, that you should. So talking about developing our skills, please yes. talk about the sales house. I, I was so oh. impressed with your launch and uh, the website and, and all the materials on there looks really, really magnificent. So, Oh, thank you. Thank you. So the sales yeah. house, you know, the impetus was that, that, yeah, the sort of a, the sum of everything I've done throughout my career and, and helping companies and sellers transform their results. But, but I kept hearing sort of this message from sellers is that, yeah, I've been trained business to business sellers. Yeah. I've, I've been trained, but then when we get into a sales process, it's like, and we have to think, mm. what do I do? Okay. And, and so what we're missing is we're missing this, this component in the way we educate sellers that complements the training. Yeah, they need to understand the product. You need to understand your process, but you need to understand you know, what we mentioned before, these human-to-human -human sales skills, because this is what's going to propel you from where you are today to where you want to be. This is yes. skills in the gap. This makes you the whole person that somebody wants to buy from. This gives you the acumen. This yep. gives you the the foundation. So the sales house is a B2B sales growth community and the growth in two forms, personal growth, personal development. And obviously you do that, you're going to grow your revenue as well. And so we've got uh, a large number of courses. We've got uh, do live coaching every week, growth coaching, multiple hours a week. We've got uh, workshops, master classes, uh, yep. a whole panoply of content there for sellers. And the goal is for you as a seller, it's a subscription service. You come in, just spend 10 minutes a day. Mm. Yeah, just 10 minutes a day. Invest in yourself. Invest, take the initiative. Your company's not going to make this investment in you. They'll train yep. you, but they're not, they're not going to educate you. Yes. You've got to complement your training with education. Spend 10 minutes a day. And I believe, and I've seen it in my own life because this is how I grew as a professional myself, is if you do that, you'll hit quota every year. Yeah. Right? Now you're going to be you miles will. ahead. Because yeah. we, we, we all know doing a two-day sales course or a week sales course and material sits on the shelf and, you know, we remember some of it. Uh, but the, the way we're going to learn is by that ongoing day in, day out, week in, week out. And I think exactly. the sales house is a great solution for sellers who want to be professional you know, and not just get by on yeah. them, which, you know, most of them do. So. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we yeah. are currently, we're targeting individuals though. We do have enterprises that are joining, but it, it's, yeah, you, you've got to be motivated. And yeah. I, the people, it's sort of ironic, you know, the people I find in, in sales who are most motivated are those who are learning most, right? Because they're, they're so excited about what they're learning and how they can apply it. Yes. That they want to come back and learn some more. Sure. And so I was, again, at a conference recently, they're talking about external motivation. I'm not a big believer in extrinsic motivation. I think it's intrinsic, right? Yeah. So yep. come in, learn a little bit every day. You can get a little bit smarter and it'll help you expand did, it, this gap. There's so much to learn. I know I'm still learning. Uh, I've been in sales oh, me for too. 30 years and I, I'm still finding out stuff. I learned stuff from you today. <laughs> um, I, I spoke well, to a guy on... Yeah, AI in sales last week. I learned a lot out of that. Someone gave me a negotiation framework a couple of months ago I'd never seen. 
I'm incorporating that stuff. Like it, it just, it, it's endless. So uh, you know, it's, a, it's a great yeah. world out here. Right? We've got all this technology to be able to provide various means for people to learn. Yep. And you just have to take it upon yourself to say, look, I'm going to put my calendar, set aside 10 minutes every day. Mm. And I'll go to a place like the sales house or someplace similar. And I am just going to learn yep. and make this investment myself. And there's a, you know, leave you with this, this great quote that I've followed virtually my entire sales career, which is even longer than yours, which is from Thomas Huxley, who was a British philosopher at the end of the 19th century, who said that in life, you should try to learn something about everything and everything about something. Mm. And so you think about it, if you're a salesperson, you're in sales, you learn something about everything. That means just read widely, read yes. about business, you know, read business publications, you know, set up flip, you know, your or flip pad or whatever application you use that, that uh, for news, so you can scan news or technology, whatever field you're in, you know, I said business news, yes. sports, whatever, whatever you can just learn it. And then the learn everything about something is sales. Yeah. Right? Is, is you are a sales specialist. You're not a domain specialist. Sure. You want to have domain knowledge, but fundamentally as a sales professional, you should be a specialist in sales. You should learn everything you can about selling and how people make decisions and buying as you know, it's all part of the sales thing. And if you can do that, wow, you'll be way ahead of the game. Yeah. Awesome, Andy. What, what, what a great note to finish on and fantastic advice and quote. So really appreciate your engagement and time today. And I'm sure everyone got a lot out of that. Yeah, well, thank you. And yeah, just people come visit the saleshouse.com. And if I just encourage people at a minimum, join our, our daily newsletter. I put out a daily newsletter full of sales yep. advice and the saleshouse.com forward slash subscribe and just get you exposed to what we're doing and hopefully get you excited about it. Yeah. I think you got a, a free trial there or a very $1 trial, something like one, that. $1 trial as yeah. well for seven days. Yeah. Yes. That's awesome. All right, Andy. Well, I encourage everyone to uh, check out the sales house and check out Andy's podcast as well. Accelerate. It's fantastic. And uh, thanks everyone for listening and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye for now.